All right, so what does my day look like tomorrow? Breakfast, 8.15. Leave for work, 8.30. Time to walk the dog? No time to walk the dog. I'm low on gas. Gotta get gas before work. Work, 9 o'clock. Lunch is at 12. 30, clean the car out over my lunch break. One o'clock, presentation to the board of directors. Three o'clock, conference call with court. Three fifteen, conference call with regional. Out by four thirty, because I still need to stop by the bank and the pharmacy and Target and the grocery store. Seven thirty, coaching no, soccer something. practice. Nine thirty, clean the living room before finally heading to bed. Ah, <sighs> finally. Oh man, sometimes I just feel like a dog chasing its tail. Welcome to week three of our series, Crazy Busy. I want to shout out to you if you're joining us in the loft or online around the world. Thank you so much for being here. Well, if you ask the average person today, hey, how you doing? They're probably going to say, man, I'm busy. You ask them again, you probe a little bit deeper, how busy are you? They're probably going to say, I am crazy busy. Life today in this world has left most of us stressed out, exhausted, and overloaded. Our goal in this series, Crazy Busy, is to help you develop the life rhythms that God has established to uh, recharge our souls and to restore our sanity. Today we're going to talk about the rhythm of Jesus. The rhythm of Jesus. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. If you didn't bring your Bible, that's fine. We'll have the verses displayed on the screen. And if you have a smartphone, you can turn to the YouVersion app, to the Live tab, and we'll have our notes there and all the Bible verses there too. So, <clears throat> so by a show of hands in here, how many of us have ever gotten to that point in life, and we've all probably been there, where we're like, one more thing and I'm going to break Okay, yeah, most of us, and most of us actually live pretty close to that point anyway. Most of the time we're under a heavy load and we get really close, we get stressed out, we get to that break point where we're overloaded. There's all sorts of information overload, there's relational overload, there's emotional overload, and there's physical overload where we're just like, we are exhausted. That's at the point where we start to say things like, and help me out, that's the straw that broke the camel's yeah, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've had so much, I can't take it any more. Yeah, we're always so close to overload. And wouldn't it be great to have a line that kind of indicates where that overload point is? Well, there is. Let me introduce you to the Plimsoll line. In the late 1800s, Samuel Plimsoll, a British parliament member, was outraged over the death of a bunch of sailors. They were dying due to the overload of ships. They just didn't know how much was too much. As they would load them up, they'd set sail out on the seas, and sure enough, the storms would come, and whoosh, overload, and overboard would go the entire crew. Sound familiar? Kind of like us. We're overloaded. We set sail. One more thing comes, and whoosh, we're sunk. Well, Plimsoll passed a law that said all ships around the world had to have the Plimsoll line. Now, depending on the buoyancy of the water, the season of the year, what, what kind of water they were in, the, uh, the, the ship would get loaded and it would sink into the water and it would get filled up to the Plimsoll line. When it got to that line, that was it. No more. You couldn't load it. And it prevented overload. Uh, for, from then on, uh, Plimsoll became known as the sailor's friend because he looked out for the sailors and he saved their lives. Today, we're going to look at the example of the friend of sinners, the sinner's friend who looks out for us and saves our lives. If you're a note taker, if you're taking notes today, here's the big idea. Jesus, following Jesus involves following Jesus' rhythm. Following Jesus involves following Jesus. Jesus' rhythm. And we need to know about his rhythm because we have one gear, and that gear is <clears throat> overload. We just get to overload as fast as possible. If we're not already there, we pile things on to get there as soon as we can. Jesus has a full range of gears, and he's going to show us the rhythm of how to live under the load and pull back before we get to that point of overload. We're going to see that following Jesus' rhythm involves three things. The first thing is the rhythm of Jesus involves engaging 
life's problems. Engaging life's problems. Help me out. There's an old saying that goes like this. You got to do what you what you got to do. And you do. We all have to have a job. Most of us have to have a job. We have kids. We have spouses. We have uh, needy friends, needy families. We have all these things going on. And that alone is enough to keep us pretty busy. Add on top of that normal things such as going to school, moving, getting a new job. And that puts us at the crazy busy mark. Add on top of that, life's problems. Uh, economic crash, loss of a job, death in the family, and our plimsoll line is sinking underwater, and we're in that overload territory. Well, we know that, and Jesus knew that, and he lived in that. And we think we're busy? Let's take a look at the passage today and see a, li- a day in the life of Jesus. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 29. Before we get there, though, let me give you a little bit of background. First thing you need to know about Jesus here is that he was crazy busy. He had a lot to do and he always got it done. But you'll notice if you read all the gospels, you'll see he walked everywhere he went, but he never ran. He never ran. He had a lot to do and it never ended basically, but he never got into a hurry. He never rushed. Mark uses in the book of Mark, he uses the word immediately 40 plus times. Jesus was a man of action. And by this point, Jesus had been baptized, he'd called his disciples, he'd been tempted by the devil, he'd been teaching in the synagogue, he'd been casting out demons, and that's where we pick up in our text right now. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. It says, and immediately, there's that word, he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately, there it is again, They told him about her, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. So here it is. Jesus had a full day of teaching. He was in the synagogue, walking all over the place. He casted out demons, and the disciples were right there with him this whole time. They saw all this go down. So they take him to the house. You know, it's time to eat. It's time to relax. They're good buddies. That's what good folks do. They take you to the house. Time to unwind. So what's the first thing the disciples do? They give him more work. They give him more work. They bring the mother-in-law over to him to to heal her. Now, I'm thinking, I don't like to read in between the lines in the text too much, but here's what I'm thinking. They couldn't uh, heal her. They had to get Jesus to do it. Apparently, they couldn't cook either. Because I I bet you earlier in the day, they were like, hey, look. Uh, Peter's like, hey, guys, huddle up. Look, my mother-in-law, she's sick. Okay, I didn't make anything. Did you bring anything? I didn't either. I didn't make anything. We, We need to eat tonight. When Jesus gets home, first thing we're going to do is we're going to get her busy. We're going to bring mother-in-law in there, and, uh, you know, that's what we're going to do. That's plan A for eating tonight. So, uh, men, you know, <laughs> what else can we say? But what did Jesus do? How did he react? He didn't complain. He didn't refuse. He didn't back off. He engaged in life's problems. And guess what? Surprise! More problems. Let's look at verse 32. That evening at sundown... They brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases. And he cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. I want to draw your attention to verse 32. That verb, they brought, in the Greek is an imperfect verb. That means they kept bringing. They brought to him. They kept bringing. It never seemed to end. And it's obvious because the whole city lined up at the door. Jesus was crazy busy. I thought we weren't supposed to be crazy busy, but Jesus was crazy. Yeah, Jesus was crazy busy, and that's okay. I don't want you guys going out of here, hey, honey, uh, Clint said I need to quit my job because I'm crazy busy, so, you know, no, Clint didn't say that. That's not what we're saying here. That's not what this series is about. You know, I could picture it also, uh, Clint, uh, Colonial, we're not supposed to have, I'm not taking on your problems today because I'm, I'm too busy, so you're just going to, I'm sorry. No, that's not what we're doing here because you have to engage in life's problems because after all, you got to do what you got to do. You have to. This series is not about shirking our responsibilities and just chillaxing all the time. It's about helping you get into a rhythm with God and trim away what stands between you and your time with God. Because we want to make uh, time with God a priority and we want to free up our time for that. The problem is, and this is going to sting a little bit. It did for me when I thought about it. It's kind of like peroxide. It stings at first, but it heals after a little bit. The problem is, a lot of us 
we fill up our schedules with things to do in order to avoid God, to not have time with God. Author and psychologist Monica Furlong, she said, quote, Our problem is not that we take refuge from action in spiritual things, but that we take refuge from spiritual things in action. Every day we have 24 hours to do something. Every day when we go home, we get off work, and we have that little bit of spare time, that's time to do something with God, to spend with God, or to do something else. Every time we open up that Facebook, it's making a choice. Am I going to spend time on Facebook, or am I going to spend time with God? Every time we turn on the Netflix to watch that whole series of whatever we're watching, we're saying, this is more important than spending time with God. We have a choice, A or B. That's all we get. And you know what? The devil wants us to choose the Netflix, the Facebook, all these distractions. Because the devil wants us crazy busy. He wants us overloaded. He wants us to sink. And he wants us distracted. Did you know that the average person in North America watches nine years of TV in their lives? Nine years. Two of those years is spent watching commercials. We won't even mention smartphones and that kind of stuff. We won't even go there. But here's something you did know. Even without adding all those distractions of TV, smartphones, all that, just dealing with life's problems, you're probably going to be crazy busy. Your plimsoll line is probably going to be sinking underwater and you'll get to the breaking point just with the normal stuff. So you're probably wondering, well, how, how do I know if my plimsoll line, if I'm getting there, if I'm about to break? Well, here's the thing. If you think you're about to break, you're probably about to break. If you feel like you're about to break, you're probably about to break. If you suspect you're about to break, you're probably about to break. If somebody tells you you're about to break, you better turn around and just walk the other way because that's about to be a, a relationship ender right there. So Jesus was getting really close. His line was sinking underwater. He was getting overloaded. He preached. He cast out demons. Then he went to relax and then more work and more problems. You think you have problems? We think we have problems. Wait until, come and talk to me when a whole city of demon possessed people is beating down your door. That's when we have problems. Jesus was getting to that point of overload. So he shifted into a new rhythm. Remember, following Jesus involves following Jesus' rhythm. And Jesus' rhythm involves engaging in life's problems. And Jesus, the rhythm of Jesus involves disengaging for prayer. Turn with me to Mark 1, 35, verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Bring to your attention real quick, very early, he departed to a desolate place. To do what? To get all stretched up, you know, oh, I'm going to exercise some demons today. No, that's not what he did. He went out because last night he had a super crazy busy night casting out demons. All these people showed up at his door. Plus, remember, he healed his mother-in-law. She was feeling better, so, you know, probably a lot of that. Had to <laughs> kind of get away some alone time for a minute. Well, what Jesus did he chose to disengage from the noise so that he could hear the voice. And when he did that, he showed several things. He showed sacrifice. He didn't have time for that, but he made that time. He showed commitment, and he showed his dependence on the Father for strength and direction. Now, let me ask you a question, a real easy question, true or false. If Jesus was under satanic attack and he needed to spend time alone with God for strength, guidance, and direction, then we need to do so, but even more. Is that true? True. Yeah, that is very, very true. And here's the thing, a quick prayer with Jesus there wouldn't have cut it. If you're like me, you pray all day long. You know, Lord, help me out with this. Help me out with that. I may not be long in prayer, but I'm never long out of prayer. That's, that's kind of my attitude. And that's great. You know, we pray in the morning. We pray all day. That's great. But Jesus completely disengaged. That's what he needed to do. And our problem is we often make excuses for why we can't do that. And the biggest excuse we usually make is I'm just too crazy busy. I'm too crazy busy. And that makes sense because it's like, hey, I'm so busy doing all these things. I don't have time to stop doing them to do something else, to pray, to do nothing, as some might say. Well, Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran Church and the founder of the Protestant Reformation, he said, quote, 
I have so much to do today that I'm going to need to spend three hours in prayer in order to get it all done. So Martin Luther felt that prayer was the most efficient and useful time that he could spend. He was crazy busy, no doubt. And we're crazy busy. The question is, what are we crazy busy doing? If it's TV, Facebook, whatever, obviously that needs to go. But if it's crazy busy because we're engaging in life's problems, which is going to happen, then, you know, it's okay not to spend time with God because we're just doing the right thing, right? No, no. Here, go with me for just a second. I want to play out a scenario real quick. Think of it this way. If you're too busy to pray because you're super busy, crazy busy, playing catch with the kids, or you're, you're busy playing with the kids in some way, you're too busy to pray because you're, you're doing that. That's a noble thing. But here's the question for you. Who or what kind of person is it that's playing with your kids if you're too busy to pray? If you're too busy to pray because you're working all the time. Yeah, we have to work a lot of hours and, and we don't have a lot of time. Just a small window at night. If you're too busy to pray because you're too busy working, who is it sitting across the table from, from your kids and from your family? If you're too busy to pray, do you really want that kind of person living under your roof and raising your kids? See, we neglect to spend time with God. And we wonder why we're overloaded, why we're stressed out, why we're maxed out. There's a poem here that describes a lot of us, and I'll read it real quick. I got up early one morning, and I rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. Troubles just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. And he answered, you didn't ask. The rhythm of Jesus involves engaging life's problems disengaging for prayer and the rhythm of Jesus involves re-engaging with purpose re-engaging with purpose by a show of hands who in here has heard this asked before whether in person or on TV what is the meaning of life <laughs> yeah we've heard that or questions like why do I exist what's my purpose in life all these kind of questions we've asked ask a hundred people that same question you'll get a hundred answers we got answers to those coming from everywhere friends family Tom Cruise wherever you go you can get answers to those questions but who do we turn to whom is the best person to turn to let me ask you a few questions here and just answer them real quick to me who created this world who created you who sustains you who has plans for you? Who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? Yeah. So we need to stop, we need to listen, and we need to hear the voice of God. That's exactly what Jesus did, and he came out of that prayer session with laser focus and with purpose. Read with me in verse 36. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns, so that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here's the thing. Plenty of people needed to be healed. There was tons of demon casting and healing to be done right there in his midst right there. But he said, that's not why he came. Healing, casting out demons, awesome things, but they're not the best things after his prayer session with God Jesus came out with renewed focus and with purpose he said this is why I came his doing was shaped by his praying and I've had that in my own life I've had experiences like that I went to Houston one year for a mission trip it was kind of like this I was sitting at Southwestern Seminary and uh, the semester was about to close in May and a, a, a guy came in there from a church in Houston he's like hey guys guess what we're doing we're, uh, we're going to have a little mission trip here. Here's what it is. Every day for a whole week, for six weeks, you're going to come in here from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We're going to hand you a map, and you're going to go out and knock on doors all day long, and it's in June in Houston. Who wants to come? And I was like, oh, I, I guess I'm the, I, yeah. So I ended up going, and sure enough, 8 in the morning, I get a map. 
Day one goes pretty well. It was hot. But a few people came to the Lord. It was awesome. Day two, a few more came to the Lord. Day three, I get a mat jackpot. It was an apartment complex. I'd heard about all these guys hitting these apartment complexes. And that's awesome because it's, hello. You know, one boom, boom, boom after the other. Reap, reap, just reaping the harvest. This was going to be awesome. So I get to the apartment complex. You know, I'm praying. Spend a little time in prayer. Get to the first door. Here we go. See what's going to happen. Open the door. Hola, como estas? Oh, if you don't know me, yo hablo espanol como un bebe de dos años. In English, I speak Spanish like a two-year-old baby. So I can get, you know, don't do style baño. I, where, where's the bathroom? I can do that. But when it comes to spiritual things, I'm dead in the water. So it's about lunchtime. And uh, the representative from the church calls me up. She's like, hey, I'm going to come bring you lunch. Everything good? I was this close to being like, yeah, everything's good. I'm done with this map. The map had an apartment complex and three houses. I was like, oh. I almost thought about saying, I'm done with this map. You know, let's go on to the next place. Give me a new map. And she came and she gave me some lunch. And I, I didn't. I kept the map and I sat there and prayed. And I prayed, Lord, why would you send me here to Houston to do this? Is it to... To just melt in the sun. Lord, I'm here for you. I'm here to do this for you. Let's bring in the harvest. Let's do this. And uh, I just got this overwhelming feeling. Finish the map. Finish the map. Because I was just about to toss it and move on. And so I did. It was about 7 p.m. I'd finished the apartment complex. Knocked on the last door. Somebody invited me in. I had some great tamales. It was awesome. <laughs> and 95% uh, of that complex was Spanish. And I just... I just finished, I finished the map. So I called them up. I was like, hey, come get me. I'm done over here. They're like, all right, we'll be right there. I, I took the map, threw it in the trash, and then I picked it up because I remembered, wait a minute, there was three houses on the back of that map. <sighs> Finish the map. Okay, you know, I'm going to be obedient. Here I go. Go to the first house. About to knock on the door. I look in the driveway. There's a kid, and he's sitting inside the car. He's got his headphones on. He's got his phone. He's about 17. Dude's crying. So I'm like, I don't know. Go over there, knock on his window, ask him, hey, man, what's going on? We start talking. End of the, end of the story there. Kid comes to faith in Christ right there. Yeah, it gets better. His sister comes out. She comes out of the house crying, gets in the side of the car. Didn't even see me. I'm on this side. She gets on this side of the car. She's crying. She's like, Who, what, what's going on? Who are you? So I tell her what's going on. The kid's like, I just prayed to receive Christ. It's so awesome. She's like, I want to do that. Right then and there, the sister prayed to receive Christ. Next thing I know, here comes the dad. He comes out of the house. He's storming mad, coming after the daughter. And he's like, what's going on here and all this? Start talking to him, prayed to receive Christ. Mom comes out. She was crying. They'd been having a fight, throwing things and all that. Mom comes out crying, looking for everybody. She prays to receive Christ. Whole family comes to Christ right there. Finish the map. Next thing I do, I go to the next house. Hey, that wouldn't do bad. Knock on the door. This dude comes out. He looks like Kimbo Slice. He's got hair like this. Dude is huge. He's not wearing a shirt, and he's wearing Eminem pajamas. And I'm like, oh, boy. He's like, what do you want? I was like, oh, you know. So we start talking. He thinks he's a Muslim. We go through all this kind of stuff. End of the story, he comes to faith in Christ. Finish the map. I'm thinking, finish the map. Go to the next house, same thing. Finish the map. It was so awesome. Man, it was, I was just pumped up. Um, but my doing was shaped by my praying. That wasn't me. I didn't do anything. That whole day, it was obvious. I didn't do anything. It was all God. Now, here's the thing. When we go and pray, like me there, you may not hear an audible voice. You may not see the sun, you know, come break through the clouds and, oh, you may not. Have, if you do, let me know. I want to hear about that. That's pretty cool. But you may not hear an audible voice. But I want to tell you, if you are submitted and committed to God, then he's going to make situations work out for you and for his will. Because it says so in the Bible. In Romans 8, 28, it says, for we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. Notice those last two words, his purpose. How do we find out his purpose? One is through the Bible, and two, we have to spend time and pray. Martin Luther, who we talked about earlier, he also said, To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. 
can't be a Christian without prayer. That's what Martin Luther's saying. We have to take the time and pray. Let me sum it up for us real quick. Following Jesus involves following Jesus' rhythm. When we engage in life's problems, we're going to be crazy busy. Just life's problems alone is enough to overwhelm us and even overload us. Our plimsoll line is going to be sinking closer and closer and further and further past that overload mark. So when that happens, we need to disengage for prayer so we can re-engage with purpose. As we close today... I want to talk about, remember that poem we read earlier? Let me read it again. That wasn't the end. There's an ending to that. The poem says, I got up early one morning, and I rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish. I didn't have time to pray. Troubles just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. And he answered, you didn't ask. Thankfully, that's not the end. This is the end. I woke up early this morning. And paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take the time and pray. Let's pray. God, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you that we can be here. That you hear our prayers, Lord. We just thank you that you you always are listening to us. And if we will be honest and we will be open and we will pray to you that you will hear us, Lord. We just cannot come humbly enough to you. Lord, help us to take that time and to pray. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, as we continue to pray to the Lord, you as a Christian in here, you might be saying to yourself, you know what, I haven't taken the time to pray. I haven't been with God as much as I should. I need to come to the Lord and I need to be in prayer and I've been avoiding it with busyness and avoiding Him. If that's you today and you want to re-engage with purpose, you want to get into prayer with God and say, God, I'm coming back to you. I've had enough of doing this on my own. I'm coming back. If that's you as a Christian today, then just slip your hand up in the air. Mm. As hands are going up all around the room, and let me pray for you guys. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you again that you hear us lord we're coming back to you this isn't us we can't do anything on our own lord it's in your strength and in your power that we move that we operate that we breathe god help us to overcome this crazy busyness and help us focus on you and what you have for us lord and as we continue to pray there are some of you in here you don't even have a relationship with god you just can't think of a time where you've come to the lord and had that moment where you've totally surrendered. You're feeling overloaded right now. You've got that plimsoll line. It's sinking deep into the water, and you're about to go over. You've got the weight of the world on you, overload from every direction, and you have that weight of sin overloading you too, and you're almost sunk. Well, you're not alone in this. The Lord wants to take that from you. Jesus Christ wants to help you out. He wants to take all of that weight, take it from you, and take that overload off of you. He wants to take that shame and that guilt and everything you carry and put it on himself. If that's what you want today and you want to know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all you have to do to get right with God today is A, B, C. A. Admit that you've done wrong in the eyes of the Lord, that you've gone and that you've done your own thing. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again, that we may have eternal life. And then C. Call on Jesus. You can't save yourself, so call on Jesus and ask him to save you. If that's you today and you said, Jesus, I want you today. I'm calling on you. I'm praying for you to save me today. If that's your prayer today, then just slip your hand up in the air. Just slip your hand up right now if you're saying, Jesus, I need you today. I'm overloaded. I'm needing you. Well, his hands are going up all around the room. That is so awesome. This is our last chance, Colonia. I see you right there, sir. As hands go up all around the room, last chance, I see you guys right there. Jesus, I need you. I'm overloaded. I can't do this. I need to unload this. I need that help that only you provide. That's awesome. I see you right there. I see you right there in the front row. I see you, sir, right there. Yes, sir, I see you right there. Awesome. As br- hands are going up all around the room. If that's your prayer, last chance, slip your hand up in the air right now. Amen. I see that entire family over there. That's awesome. I see you right there, sir. 
Well, guys, if that's your prayer, let's pray today. And you're not praying alone. We're all going to pray this together. Let's pray. Dear God, I need you. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I believe you're the Son of God, and that you died for my sins, and that you rose from the grave. Forgive my sins, and fill me with your Spirit, and make me new. Thank you for forgiveness, and thank you for new life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Y'all, let's celebrate the decisions made here today in Colonial Church.